you really need to get outsized value for your investors and outsized return. And so that's just being super, super selective. Look, we've done projects where we've performed way better than we thought possible. And we've done some that, that haven't performed as well. And if I look at those ones where we didn't perform as well, it's because we weren't selective enough. Hi, I'm Gordon Lamphere, and welcome to The Real Finds Podcast, the podcast that we interview key entrepreneurs, activists, and researchers shaping the real estate industry and, as a result, our world. On today's podcast, we'll be speaking with Stephen Wendell. Stephen is an experienced investor and developer across a wide range of asset classes. On today's podcast, we discuss his journey into real estate, the evolving state of hospitality, strategies to identify gaps in the marketplace, and the power of creating unique experiences and brands. It's well worth a listen. Hey, Stephen, thanks for hopping on the podcast. Hey, Gordon, thanks for for having me. I'm glad to be here. So I wanted to ask you first, why real estate? Because, you know, you look at your background, you've got law, You've got, it looks like you worked for the Eagles at one point. Yeah. Why real estate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's really, I I do have a natural inclination to it, but I don't think I would if it wasn't for my father kind of being in that industry growing up. He, um, from when I was born, he was doing, he's CPA and was doing some stuff before I was born, but he was firmly into the real estate world by the time I was born in 1983. So he opened his first hotel the year, the month I was born. So I was kind of like around it from the, from, you know, zero. And so I I was always intrigued by it. Uh, And then, you know, went to school, went to law school and, and came out and came out during the recession, uh, the the global financial crisis. So instead of going to the firm directly in New York to Proskauer, they kind of sent us to clients for a year to kind of, you know, pay us a little less, but keep us around the rim until we could come to the firm when business had picked up. And they're a huge sports law firm. So I got to work for the Philadelphia Eagles for a year. Now I'm a lifelong Birds fan. And uh, when I was living there, I just kind of got intrigued with the city and trying to understand like why there were gaps in the road, you know, very close to center city. And I think that real estate bug kind of was there and I had enough time to kind of explore. Um, You know, I was getting paid by a firm and not by the Eagles. So it wasn't the hardest job in the world. And so that we did a couple of deals, one in particular that kind of started off and then that got the bug going. And, you know, I said, dad, let you know, after a year at the law firm, I was like, let's, let's go do real estate full time. Let's do some more non-hotel stuff. And then on the hotel side, let's um, take your strong relationships with the brands and let's build in some more kind of urban environments um, and college towns in the Southeast and that that was kind of 2011 and uh here we are you know almost 15 years later um still doing it you know thesis has changed probably a little bit but um you know that that's it so i'm definitely gonna try to get back to your thesis and try to understand a little bit more about how you perceive the market and and, and how you think there are those gaps in the market yeah what we really wanted to talk about that is uh, early in the podcast is is seeing those gaps. So, w- what lead you, what led you to believe that there were gaps in the Philadelphia market beyond just empty spots? And how do you see those gaps kind of elsewhere? Yeah, great question. So, Philly in particular was it? It's a really interesting city if you haven't lived there. Um, and then living there, you see it very, very differently. And I don't want to claim to be a Philadelphian. I don't want them coming out on this podcast and getting angry at me. I'm mean, it's an adopted city for me, but. Um, you know, Center City is such a tight, you know, area when you compare it to other urban centers. And uh, the the zoning in Center City, Philadelphia is nothing is ever by right. So getting through the rezoning process, extremely difficult. You have to have a lot of time and patience and know the right people on the ground. And so for that reason, a ton of, you know, what would you say, traditional multifamily, traditional nationwide office developers won't enter that that market as a developer because it's just too much time, too much risk. They'd rather just come in and and buy the existing asset. So there's, you know, and the cap rates don't, you know, they're a little higher there than obviously DC or New York, 
but there is a real spread in being able to get a project actually done there. Um, and so that is what I learned early on a very small project. And we got very lucky to, to kind of meet a property management brokerage firm in OCF Realty that really understands the city really well. And so we've been able to do almost over 10 projects over the last decade there. And we're actually building right now, three, four months from finishing 247 apartments on top of a commercial space that are released to CVS and Aldi. And that's on Washington Avenue, which is the kind of new southern boundary corridor of the city. Um, and, you know, and I think a lot of people forget it's like the fifth or sixth largest city in the country. Uh, it gets often overlooked by New York and D.C. There's no, nowhere near as much development of those two cities. So we, we view it as kind of this underdog city. I know a lot of the residents view it that way, too, which is why they're so passionate about their sports teams. Um, and so that's that that was that city in general. And then I'd say globally, or not globally, but, you know, other markets, um, you know, we, we can identify where I think hotels, you know, obviously we do Mountain Shore, we do hotels and non-hotels. Um, on the hotel side, it's a little easier to kind of soft circle a city that you think is really on the rise, i.e. Nashville in 2014. It was like, okay, this is going to go really good. Uh, and then it's like, where do we go? Which neighborhood do we want to put it in? Uh, and, and that's kind of the, the the MO there. I think you really need to understand a city almost from a living standpoint to know where to put residents office. So the amount of cities where we'll do hotels is much bigger than the amount of hotel uh, cities where we will do non-hotels. I have to have lived there. One of us has lived there. So Charleston, South Carolina, where I'm from, where I am right now, we will do anything because I know it very, very well. Um, and you can pick the sub pocket or the sub neighborhood where a certain asset class uh, should go. I'd love to dive into that in terms of yeah. understanding sub neighborhoods and sub pockets. But one of the things that we wanted to kind of go in is, and I know you mentioned it, that there's a big disparity between the difference of the hospitality world versus some other asset classes. So yes, yeah. the state of hospitality right I'm I'm an office industrial expert, but one of the things we find fascinating about hospitality is it's very service driven versus yeah. like our industry, which should be more service driven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of our guests find a tremendous value in that asset class. What are you seeing in hospitality in in 24? Man, it is crazy right now, in my opinion, because and I'll try not to get too long winded, but. Um, you know, when I got in in 2011, I really knew nothing other than what I had gathered through osmosis through my father. And, you know, this is a guy that did the 13th Hampton Inn in the country in, in the mid 80s. Now there's 3000. So traditional select service box, which, you know, Hilton got very, they did it right. Um, and, and it still survives today and it thrives today, the Hampton Inn box. But you got to remember when like, the whole like franchising model and like hotels going everywhere, uh, it's one generation old, you know, and, and if you go look at the 80s and the 90s, it started, people were building them, but not like the rapid pace that we have now. And so now we've got, you know, five major companies, huge value companies in Accor, Hyatt, Aichi, Marriott and Hilton that are prolifer. I mean, like the, the, the amount of hotels that they're putting out via franchise model is incredible and there's in my opinion too many flags um there's too much same excuse me too much sameness and but there's this you know desire for shareholder value to go up well the only way it goes up is through fees and through growth so they need more hotels and if you've already put a hampton in in every single city in the united states well we got to do something's a little different than a hampton in but it's also going to take market share. And so I understand that. And there, there is different concepts, extended stay versus select up and down the scale that, that serve different customer bases. But you have to understand the fundamental difference here that, you know, if two hotel, if one hotel is getting $6 million in revenue and a second hotel comes and that first hotel now gets four and a half or five, but the other hotel also gets three and a half or four, you know, as long as those two hotels are still profitable and can pay 
Hilton or Marriott, the franchisee franchisor is in a better shape, but not necessarily that first hotel guy. So when you're picking um, places to develop, first, you have to know that you're going into a good location because otherwise, why would you do it? But if you're going into a good location, people are going to develop on top of you and, and you need to build something that really survives the test of time and can, you know, support a 20 year mortgage or 25 year mortgage, whatever you're putting on it. And, you know, sometimes that is a hint and end and, and it'll work. We have a Marriott courtyard in Charleston, West Virginia, the capital that still is the newest hotel that was built in that sub downtown market since 2016. Well, great. That doesn't need some fancy boutique hotel to, to, you know, maybe long last. So each sub pocket, each market is different and what I think is the proper uh, thing to build. And we are in a time now where the value of the franchise might not necessarily go 20 years, uh, but man, they got all of the brand power and the loyalty and the customers. So doing it without them is really, really tough. So I think the brands are all in really good positions, and but as a franchisee, you need to be selective, smart. You can't just go do something. You can go do something just because, but to actually go and take on the risk of developing the hotel asset versus just buying stock in those five companies, you really need to get outsized value for your investors and outsized return. And so that's just being super, super selective. Look, we've done projects where we've performed way better than we thought possible. And we've done some that, that haven't performed as well. And if I look at those ones where we didn't perform as well, it's because we weren't selective enough. Can you tell me about a time when you were selective and found kind of a niche and maybe like a moderately saturated market? So I, I think most of our investors that listen to the podcast are in saturated markets. And it's New York, LA, Los Angeles, even, even you know, Chicago, Dallas, Philadelphia, Miami. And so yeah. they're sitting there and they're saying, how do you niche down and find that sub market that you can find it or that asset class that maybe yeah, 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 yeah. Just just one block further. So how, well, how do you can you tell me about a time when? when you yeah, did? I can tell you a couple times. You know, and, and you know, one of the reasons we love these southeast markets, other than where we're from, them, a lot of people moving there. They largely underdeveloped, and, and you can kind of understand where the trend's going. Um, I mean, Charlottesville, Virginia is a great example of one kind of the first deal I was involved in when I came over to the company, and you know not a city you know that everybody knows about obviously university of virginia is there which is one of the reasons we know about it um, my dad actually kind of started his working life and, and his marriage uh working there and then i went to law school there and so we kind of have that tie and i was in law school and i was like dad you know you gotta build a hotel here there's not enough and there's so many people like this this is like this is a great spot but then we said well you know you could go out to the main thoroughfare and just the land went for days and, you know, the connector between um, Charlottesville and DC and you just plop one. Right. And, you know, okay, that would be all right. I was like, no, 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 you gotta be walkable to the university and downtown. And so then it's main street, which is kind of a mile from downtown to uh, the university. But then you start talking barriers to entry, architectural review board, all the stuff. But, we found a property on the corner and it was great and it had all kinds of really hard restrictions and it took two years to get it through the review board, but we, we got it there and we built this residence in, uh, which, you know, we have sold to Noble, uh, the REIT out of Atlanta, but that is a great example. And that thing is still humming. Uh, it was hard for us to sell it. Um, but you know, it's now, you know, when did we open that? 16, I mean, that, that's probably 10 years, seven, eight years, nine years old, and it's still just crushing. And that's location, location, location. Another example in Tallahassee, Florida, you know, there's the university and the capital. Um, they're separated by this, this, you know, land that's mile-ish long. And for the longest time, it was not developed, not developed, not developed just the capital or just the university. And then as it's starting to get developed, all the student housing has been built. There's restaurants and stuff going on. And now it's like, wow, this is where a hotel could go. 
before it was not a nice enough area. Now it's great. And you can pull from both the university and from the Capitol. Um, and so we do a Hampton Inn there. We actually did a Hampton Inn and a Hyatt house uh, separated by a couple of years. And that Hampton just like out of the gates, just skyrocket, just unbelievable performance. And so those are areas where oftentimes the locals, the local developers won't have done it yet because it's not pop of mind to them and it's really hard sometimes as a local i can say that being in charleston it's sometimes hard to view your city almost as it is because you you you've been in it so much and you're used to your own bias it's really hard to see it that way and you know i think a lot of the opportunity from people not from nashville has been there because it's like how could you see it moving as fast as it was when you're there you just your 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 bias is is that no like we can't have all of Sobro be completely developed and you know it's just there's no way to predict it when you when you live there almost yeah a, a fish doesn't always realize they're swimming in water right so um, absolutely absolutely the advantage we get from I'd say that's one of our advantages from developing in different cities versus just one city so in terms of um, your strategy. You've mentioned college towns a couple of different times already. So why do you focus on college towns in particular versus, yeah. you know, other other assets or other or other metro areas, I should say? Yeah, you know, I, we just, it was a simple thesis to start that, you know, hotels are about demand generators and this demand generators aren't going anywhere. Now, I, you talk about something that's changed over 10 years. Certain colleges are going nowhere. Certain other colleges are going somewhere, and, and they're going to cease to exist, possibly, um, or they'll be swallowed by some of the big ones. But you know, we love that as the recurring, uh, and it wasn't just you know two times a year, three times a year, it's all year long. Take a place like Tallahassee and Charlottesville; they've got huge sports presence. Tallahassee is a bonus. Uh, Nashville is a bonus because they are also the capital city. And so when you have this multitude of demand generators that really aren't going anywhere, i.e. the capital and the, the university, that is just such a baseline comfort that, you know, you're going to have a smoothness of business, which then gives you an ability to kind of know what your dance at downside is. But also as a rate management tool, like, you know, you're going to have not only constant bookings, but bookings very far in the future because of large events like game days and like, you know, legislative session. And that then gives you the power to price properly. And it's just, it all, it all feeds into it. And, and we've just found that they are really catalysts. Um, and then now you look at it, okay, what are we doing a boutique in a college town? How do we kind of get the town also wrapped in, the locals wrapped into wanting to come there. And, and, and you know, the, the boutiques that we've done over the last spot four years are very new for us. And so that's a whole different transition for the hotel aspect of the company. But um, a lot of the same tenements are there. Oh, I know I'm going to get back to the boutiques, but I'm curious, you mentioned college towns that are disappearing and certainly enrollments down. Um, what are you seeing in terms of that? Because there are a lot of people that might be interested in investing in college towns. What do you see as maybe not the best strategy for entering a town? And, and what's kind of a town that might be, you know, yeah, I'm trying to think of one that has like a small, like kind of, you know, a lot of the towns that we're looking at are big time college towns. Like we're getting ready to do a project in Madison, Wisconsin, fifty thousand students. So if I was doing a kind of apartment project in a town where a small college was. And I was just banking on student. Yet yeah, that is where and, and and enrollment was declining. That is where I would get very kind of nervous um, because some of these you know colleges. And I can't remember the one in Philadelphia is art college that just like suddenly closed. And so if I was like, well, I've got a building there. These students are going to be there the whole time. I, you know, I would really want to make sure it was a a big university um, because not only are the finances tough, but you know, the value of the four year education if, if you know you don't go to one of the top 50 schools is now really in question and starting you know to be to be questioned which it should be um because you're you know not guaranteed of some six-figure job 
And you're also losing four years of the workforce that you could be in. So it's, it's, it better, it better pay, you know? Um, so. Well, in terms of like losing time, which it certainly, uh, that's a worry for a lot of folks and why we're seeing decline in admission. One of the things right. that people lose time in is, is searching. And I just feel like they aimlessly search. So yeah. beyond colleges, what's your search criteria when you're looking for a site location? I, I know you mentioned walkability in Charleston. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is walkability a big feature um, when you're looking at a, a program? Because yeah. it's kind of hard to find in the South in, in some spots. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it really is. Um, for hotels specifically, and uh, yeah, I mean, the best example is Louisville that I can give you right off the top of my head because we just did it. You know, that's a town where it's like, okay, I understand this city and the core city, but then there's this new up and coming neighborhood. And I feel like every city that is growing from a population standpoint has an up and coming neighborhood. And I'm not just saying, let's go to the token up and coming neighborhood. And that's what we do. And that's all we do. Louisville was a great example of like, okay, we've got a really vibrant city that has spent hundreds of millions of dollars on their new convention center. And then a mile from center city, Louisville, is this new neighborhood called New Lou that has all these historic buildings that restaurants have moved to, that shops have moved to. And it's just like, okay, this is where it's going. And that's an easy one where having been in Nashville, you look at a city like that and you understand that, okay, well, I'm not going to you know, say it's going to be Nashville. I don't know if there will be another Nashville the way that it is gone. But if you look at a city like Louisville and you know that that neighborhood is just only going to get better. So if your basis is good, you you know you're going to build upwards. And I'd rather be a little too early to a neighborhood than too late um, all the time. Uh, as long as I feel like that neighborhood's coming, even if it takes several years for it to come, I can ride that wave up. If you spend too much in your basis on a neighborhood that's kind of already peak, you know, yeah, you might not go bankrupt and lose all your, uh, you're not going to, you know, maybe not cover your debt, but you might lose money. Yeah. So when you're looking at an early neighborhood entry, are you primarily going and in, investing in building the project, even like somewhat spec? Uh, or are you sitting on land? How do you guys usually look at an so, early neighborhood entry? Both, right? And and I think we, we this light, recent, you know, we've been doing real estate forever and, and now we have a real estate fund, which we started in 2021, which one of the advantages of that is that we can do both, right? Okay, we're ready. We bought it. Let's go ahead and build. It's ready. But in another couple instances, like Chattanooga, we own a piece of land and we've owned it now for a bit. And it's just south side of Chattanooga. It's there, but it's the rate of the, the, the ADRs of the hotels is not quite where I'd want to see it. And so no big deal. We'll, we'll, we'll hold the land and we'll wait. Um, and that is, you know, if you buy a piece of land in a, in an area that is growing, as long as it's not crazy to carry it, which often it's not, because it's in a growing area that doesn't have as crazy real estate taxes, insurance, all this stuff, you can wait and, and, and then develop it properly. And then, and then worst case you say, you know what, I, I don't, I don't, whatever, there's other opportunities. Let's just sell the land and there'll be someone else to. To, to buy it that does want to take that risk and look at it differently. So um, we, we, are, we are doing both. Louisville, we bought and went real quick. Um, Charleston, Chattanooga, we, we have a property in North Charleston that we probably will move on next. In Chattanooga, we're going to wait probably still another year before we do anything. So I, I know you mentioned um, brands earlier, and uh, I think branding is, is one of the most under-talked about parts of the real estate industry. Um, I'm curious what do guests look for in a brand? Because yeah, I know, I know in hospitality that that's crucial. Um, yeah. And um, what are you seeing in the market? Versus, you know, what you saw maybe even five or 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great question. So if it is hard branded, Hampton Inn, Marriott Courtyard, they're looking for sameness and repeatability. And, you know, the, it's a there's a reason that the legacy the longest lasting ones like Hampton have continued to succeed even with all of these other things that have, other brands that have come about it's because every customer really knows what they're going to get out of Hampton Inn and they know what they're paying for and Hilton's brand standards are, are pretty 
sound. And yes, they changed them over time to, to deal with mobile check-in and all, all of that kind of stuff. But man, they know what they're going to get. They know what they're going to pay for. And, and that business traveler that's going for one night, you know, they can pick from what they like. When you go to the boutiques, man, you need individuality. You need to be unique. You need to not only make the guests feel like they're in some place special, but you need the locals that live around it to feel like they're around something special. And it can't just be a token name or a token something. And I think, you know, people that aren't in the industry, you start talking to them about branding. And even before I started doing boutiques or we started doing boutiques, I didn't understand the value of it. I didn't understand the value of interior design. And I didn't understand the value of any of that the way that I do now and how small decisions that you make, um, sometimes ones that you make in a phone call on a on one of a, a weekly phone call, it takes five minutes to make it. And then it has this huge impact. I mean, you take Louisville, one of our early design calls, we went from square we windows, uh, or rectangular windows on the top to arch. And it's a new building and all the old buildings have arched windows on the top. So we kind of wanted to pay homage to them. And I can't tell you how many people have been like, man, we love those windows on the top. It's such a great thing. It makes it look like the building has been here for a long time. And, you know, and just as easily, we could have not thought of that. And I know that's a little different than branding, but that's the identity of the hotel. No. And it's incredibly important. No, for sure. I mean, beyond, beyond just the architecture, how do you create that feeling of special? Because yeah, because design can be a great way to do that. But are there ways outside of architectural design that you give that boutique and that specialty feeling? Oh yeah, I mean w with architectural design, interior design, and, and and all branding. But then the culture of, of the people that you hire, and and you know trying to hire locally, and getting those people to work and share the same mission of providing, you know, great guest service and and making the guests feel you know super welcome and and that it isn't it, it is a special experience i mean i you know have recently read will godard's book unreasonable hospitality which i would recommend anybody in the service industry to to read it, it it's you know no secret at this point what they have been able to accomplish or he's been able to accomplish with his team at 11 madison park but it's so it's such a good read for the little things it's and, and we're now in a world where certain things are just a given they will check in like there, there's things that just everyone has to provide it's it's table stakes and so and they're becoming more automated and um, and more mandated and they're and and so how do you differentiate yourself it often comes down to the little things and it's like well gosh those are just little things and it's like yeah but they're big things to certain people and if you do one little thing for two guests each day well, that's, you know, 800 guests at the end of the year that you've impacted who are then going out in the world and talking about your place. And so it's really that, you know, they say hospitality is a 24-7, 365 business, and it really is. Can you give me an example of like a, a little thing that, that maybe yeah. you know, might do for guests? Yeah, if you have a VIP coming in, you know, we've got folks in Louisville coming in from urban brands all over the world and and making sure that that little bottle is is there in their room with a personal note um it, it is is something that you know they see and they read and or if you have a vip coming in for a you know our property in upstate new york we have um you know big people celebrate sell, people celebrating weddings events and really making you know that as special as it can be for them and taking the time to ask them Hey, what's your, you know, favorite X Y Z thing, and going out and procuring it for them and having it in the room, as opposed to just putting a random bottle of X Y Z and you don't even know if they drink wine, you know, like that. That doesn't. It's like it's nice. The worst thing ever is that little token gift that's still sitting there when the person's done. Like, hey, thank you, but I I didn't even really want it. Um, and it's like, well. You could have done something that, and that was an eighty dollar bottle of wine. All right, we stock it back and whatever. Um, and it's like, well, you could have done something that, and that was an eighty dollar bottle of wine. All right, we stock it back and whatever. But I, there could have been something that was cost ten dollars that 
they would have just loved if you took the time to ask the question. Um, so, and look, the bigger the property, the harder it is to do that. You can't do it for everybody. Um, you know, in Louisville, we have this booklet that everybody gets when they get in that tells the story of the hotel, the branding, the city, and gives little factoids about that. It's like a little guide. And so that's a great example of something we thought of in, in the beginning. Um, you know, we're doing a project and I, I'm originally from West Virginia and we're, we're building a hotel there and um, I'm kind of naming the restaurant after my grandmother and she had this like famous Chex Mix. And so we're going to remake it and it's going to be like in everybody's room when they get there. So th those are the things that you kind of like imagine and then you execute and then you see how people react to them. It's awesome. So one of the things I think you've done that's pretty awesome as well is you've gone kind of a little bit outside of your asset class that you started yeah. in, which was hospitality. Yeah. And I'm curious if you've taken some of these strategic site location techniques and tools and strategies, as well as kind of that hospitality touch to other industries. Uh, like, yeah. I, I know you've been involved in some office, I think a couple other projects as well. Um, For sure. That's yeah. right. Yeah, 100%. I mean, we're building an apartment building now and just even thinking about the common area and, and like how you can make that more special and not just do it some token, you know, apartment building uh, common area. But great example of that is an office building in Charleston that we're involved in. Um, it's on the upper part of the peninsula, which is, you know, historically not been developed. And we joint ventured with a, with a guy here that had already bought an old standard oil site that, you know, had been contaminated. It had three small buildings that he had turned into kind of creative office. And his vision was to build a new three-story structure and a huge outdoor amphitheater, which would be Charleston Peninsula's only outdoor music venue. And it's like near this rail line. I mean, it's a whole thing. And um, the bottom floor of that office building would have um, um, F and B component. So top two floors are office. Some of the ground floor else on um, facing the street is. And so now we had this whole campus, which included restaurants, a brewery, um, a music venue and creative office. And when I say creative office, I mean, people have to have a creative mind to be like, wait, I'm not just going into a regular office building. And so this plan was before COVID. So then COVID happens and we are delivering this property a year into COVID. And we lease it up because it's the type of place that people still want to be in and be around because there is this hospitality element to it. Um, and like the default thinking is, wow, man, I don't want an amphitheater at my office site. And it's like, well, not everybody does, but we're not playing music at noon. We're playing music at you know seven o'clock on a Friday. And so now everybody is like really excited to be involved in this space. And we give them you know, free access to the concerts when they come and there's VIP act. And so there's that element of adding something to something that's traditional that then makes it better. Um, and it's really at no cost. Um, it's just thoughtfulness. And so that office building is 100% occupied. Um, and so this traditional high rise sitting in Chicago that everyone's like, oh, it's not good. You know, we're not experiencing that in Charleston. And I think that's been the story of kind of post-COVID. We're in a world now where there is some stuff doing really, really well. And then there's some stuff doing not so well. And so the economy usually points one way and everything kind of points generally in that direction. And what we're seeing right now is a lot of stuff pointing up and a lot of stuff pointing down. And we're trying to fake, make heads or tails of it. You know, all of us are. Yeah, I think creative destruction is... Uh, general positive for the market and things will sort themselves out. I think it's funny with your amphitheater comment, because I'm, as I'm sitting here, I could look out my window and we have an amphitheater here in our office that, that is well leased as well, right? Like, yeah, it's awesome. About, it's about creating that experience that's a little bit different. I know, you know, we're having food trucks today and a band and, exactly. and stuff like that that are going on. And folks are just trying to do, you know, your standard class B office. They're going to get eaten alive. So um, in, ter in terms of trying to eat folks alive in the market and through process of creative destruction, 
I know we talked about identifying site selection. I know we talked about um, all sorts of factors in terms of what the customer's looking for. Um, the last thing I'm curious about um, is when you look and you find a property, um, are you a land buyer primarily? Are you a buyer that's looking at trying to find sites that are currently existing and, and, and rehab them? What is it that you look at when you're ideally looking at a little? Yeah, mostly land buying. We will do some rehabilitation. I mean, the Madison deal was, is a rehab of an old office building, but it was the original first skyscraper in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, that deal, the, the, the landowners are putting it into the deal. A lot of times what we end up doing or having to do, Louisville the same way, you know, we've built now 28 hotels. I think over half of them, the landowners have put the land in the deal or the building in the deal to do the deal. Um, so oftentimes we're looking at stuff that's off market and have to get take a year for someone to trust you, um, which I understand in today's world, trust is, trust is earned. It, it is a tough thing um, because we're just dealing in a different time now. And so that is often what I'm we're looking for is land that is off market um but that that's in the right area and that, that there's a deal sometimes the the group wants to sell it and you got to negotiate the price sometimes they they want to put it in the deal and uh then that takes a little bit longer um so I mean, it's worked for us a lot of developers don't want you know new partners that aren't their existing partners and we figured out a way to to work, have that work for us and when we develop in all these different cities usually that partner that land partner is local and they know the jurisdiction and they know what the, the the bad things to do and the right things to do so that's been extremely helpful to us and leaned on and even if they're not in real estate having a local partner i think gives you some le legitimacy uh to the community uh especially when you're talking about community uh when you're developing you don't live there but your partner does that that helps a lot so I, I, know, I know you mentioned finding off-market opportunities. Do you primarily uh, find those through local land partners? How is it that you find these off-market opportunities, particularly as an outside the community? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things is we kind of concentrate ourselves like east of the Mississippi first. So it's like, okay, I'm not even looking. Like someone calls me about something in, in a Bozeman, I get excited, but I'm like, I can't, I, you know, I can't, I'm not going to look at it. So and then you go east, okay, now we got 20 cities that, really i need to deal with and i, I will literally louisville I, i'll take a trip and i get a broker and you know three days and, and it's hey let's pour the market let's talk let's let you understand that i'm not here wasting your time that if you bring me a good deal in off market or on market and we do it well and here are the other cities where i have done that and look at the stuff that we've built and so sometimes you get a good broker and, and, and Louisville is a great example. We have a guy there named John Fisher that, I mean, has been more than a broker. He's been a friend and a, an ally to the property and he's now an investor in the property. So amazing stuff there. But sometimes you get one that, that doesn't take you seriously for whatever reason and, and it just kind of goes nowhere. And so that city kind of falls off. But um, that that's really how and you know that's how you know louisville happened and that's how tallahassee happened um and then those people what happens is that the hotel is usually a beachhead where we do the deal and then now i understand louisville or i understand tallahassee and i've done it and we've been in it long enough and we took a building through zoning and through the the, the permitting process oh let's go do that apartment building over there well, let's go grab this building over here and let's let's do this or let's partner with a you know, other developer that we've met that's been impressed with what we've done to do something. And so that's happened probably more frequently than I thought it would happen. And that's been a kind of unexpected byproduct of how we've developed um, and how we continue to grow. It's very opportunistic. Uh, it's a small fund by fund standards. So there's not a huge mandate to go do, you know, $300 million worth of deals, you know, so we're slow and steady. So I, I know we've been slowly steady going along, uh, but I, I think that beachhead uh, idea in communities is an absolutely essential thing. We've seen yeah. in, in our area, we, we're a Chicagoland base, so Illinois, Wisconsin, but as soon as you um, leave kind of your little niche of the world, it, if you're uh, you're just dipping your toe in the water, it's it's best not to drop a couple hundred million dollars and, and not know what you're doing. So, um, I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. In terms of going and kind of um, 
dipping our toe in the water, though, we, we'd like to do one last thing that we always do on the podcast, which is our final Perfect. Final Four is kind of a, a nice little roundup where we get to learn a little bit more about you and learn kind of how you see the world. So the question we always ask is, where do you see the real estate or hospitality going over the next 10 years? Yeah, I, I see. It's a really great question. And I do believe that this trend of lifestyle hotels, call them boutique, call them lifestyle, whatever you want to call them, is going to continue to proliferate. People want that experience when they're traveling. And I believe, uh, and look, you've seen acquisitions all the time. You know, Hyatt's buying Standard and Bunkhouse, which I'm very much in tune with. Hilton bought Nomad and, and on and on it's going to go. Uh, so the big boys are placing all their chips and their and their monopoly pieces. And I think the the interesting thing to see will be which of the brands kind of die away, how quickly that happens and what is the kind of after effect of that on franchisees and hotel developers. And, and there's going to be some, I think, winners and some, some real losers in this. And uh, I think that's going to be the change. And then how, do, how does AI, how does automation technology play in the hospitality industry? How can we use it to our advantage but not drip away hospitality and i think if you read, you know you read these books like and unreasonable hospitality you have to have the human element um to make it special and um how do we you know in a, in a world where labor is tough and it's increasing in cost how can we use the technology to our advantage but still keep all that human element and i think all that stuff is going to play out over the next 10 years so one of the human elements that we always like talk about is kind of how, how we got here. And, and we have a lot of young brokers and developers that listen, I would say, uh, of, of the podcast uh, group, I'd say probably a quarter are probably brokers and developers under 30 um, oh, wow. at, at listen. And so in terms of that, um, one of the things that we always like to ask is like when you were starting out the business and you're working your first deal, what, you know, would you tell yourself if, if you were looking? Well, patience, patience, patience. Uh, you know, this this is not a quick moving business. Some days feel like it's moving faster than you could ever imagine because there's six things going wrong on six deals. But from a development standpoint, you have to understand that there's a long term, you know, return and, and vision. And I think also dealing with mistakes. And, and I don't mean your own mistakes, just the, collectively your own and everybody's in development, you, you're going to have a hundred things go wrong, no matter what you do. Um, and so understanding that going in, I, I really did not have a good comprehension of that. And I would get very frustrated when the, you know, things went wrong and even small things. And now it, you really understand that development is about managing the risk and then managing when those things go wrong and, and, and making it not go so bad or not impact your deal so bad and staying long-term oriented on what the, what the thing is that you're trying to do. But one of the ways we like to kind of stay long-term oriented it, it is, is through education and, and educating ourselves about the market, about deal strategy, even yeah. about, you know, the human condition. And I know you've already mentioned Unreasonable Hospitality, which is a great book, and, and we've suggested it on the podcast before. Do you have another read that if someone's out there interested in learning more that uh, they should pick up? You know, that one more is the hospitality kind of element of it. Uh, I, I think there, there's various real estate books out there, but the, the one thing that I come back to, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to at Princeton take a class from Daniel Kahneman, which, you know, wrote Thinking Fast and Slow, but the, the class was called Behavioral Economics. And of course, he's the Nobel Prize winner for, for the very theory of behavioral economics. And so, you you know, you look at pinch me moments when you look back on and you certainly can't appreciate everything when you're 20 and 21 years old that, the way that you should. But as an economics major where you're taught that one plus one equals two, mostly, and then you, he's like, well, one plus one doesn't always equal two in our minds. That really changed the way that I thought um, and, and thought about. The, the kind of the world and the decisions that we were making and about my own decisions and how I view risk and money. And, and therefore, if I'm viewing it irrationally sometimes, and I'm a pretty rational person, then how many other people are viewing it irrationally? And, and it's just 
it trickles through everything. Like the way that you raise money, the way that you put money out, the way that you take on risk, the way that the guest thinks about values A versus B and depending on where they're coming from. And so that book and, and, and his kind of theories in general have made it easier for me to understand what is a very irrational world. World is irrational. And hopefully we can at least rationally deal with it. Um, it, it. it. In terms of that, the whole idea for the podcast is all about people, right? And dealing with people. And yeah. um, we firmly believe that when we're, when we're reaching out and, and, and going onto the market, that men and women in the arena know who to reach out to best. And I, I know you mes- mentioned John Fisher earlier on the podcast, but is there somebody else that you know we should be reaching out to in the in the world of real estate to learn a little bit more about what's going on uh, and have on the podcast next? Oh, you know, I could just say my partner Ryan, but uh, you know, I don't know I- I- exactly who that that is. I think there's really so AI is coming, and I don't understand it very much. I mean, I've used ChatGPT, but you know, I'm I'm. Speaking of Bunkhouse, the former founder, Liz, is, is 3D printing a whole hotel in Marfa, Texas right now. So what is technology doing and how, and it's moving so fast and what are the real implications? And I would love to hear from someone that like actually can say, well, this is going to be here in 10 years. This is going to be here in 15. So gosh, if I'm putting a deal in the ground now that like is going to be obsolete for X, Y, Z reason. Or how can I, you know, how can I think about that and where that's changing? Or even you look at cars, are we going to go self-driving? Okay, yeah, probably, especially on the highways. So are, are highway hotels just, what are they, why would I build them if I'm going from city to city? And so, like, there's some real, like, big things that haven't happened yet, that but are being talked about and the inertia is that way that if they were true today would have major impacts on existing assets and, and development. And I would love to hear someone who, you know, could synthesize all that because it's really sometimes hard for my brain to even contemplate and think about. Yeah, we definitely had several futurists on and, and we're certainly looking at exploring that more. But there's one last thing we'd like to explore in the podcast before we finish up. And it's just, what's the best way for someone to reach out to you um, and get in contact. Absolutely. Yeah. It's Stephen at mountainshoreproperties.com. And you can also go onto the website and kind of do the contact form, but you know, you can email me directly. Um, we're looking, you know, always for new opportunities and, and I'm a, I'm a, you know, as a lawyer, so I'm an inbox zero guy. So I don't miss very many emails. I, I wish I was sometimes, uh, sometimes the emails overwhelm me. Uh, Stephen, thanks for hopping on the podcast and, uh, Uh, We have to have you on in the future. Hey, thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Thanks again to Steven. We really appreciate his insights. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please give us a like, a five-star rating, and a review. Your comments and interactions and subscriptions truly matter, and they help us continue to provide quality guests. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, or pretty much wherever you can get your podcasts. I'm Gordon Lanfear with The Real Finds Podcast. Thank you for listening.